it's my uh, special pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Professor Karl-Heinz Landanke from GSI, Director of GSI, uh, who will tell us today about uh, Universe in the Lab. Um, and so uh, Karl-Heinz uh, initially got his PhD at the University of Münster, and then he went on a postdoctoral position to the University of uh, to Caltech in California, and then he became a professor back in Münster in Germany, uh, but uh, was not quite decided where to, where to want to stay, so he went back as a professor to uh, Caltech uh, before, after some time there, uh, for family reasons, he went back to uh, Denmark, Aarhus University, until uh, finally he went uh, to where he is now, to GSI, where he has first been a scientific director, and since a uh, few years he's also uh, the actual director of GSI and can send away billions of uh, dollars with a uh, slide of a hand. Uh, not quite, but very briefly, last week it was announced that the next generation of uh, nuclear uh, facility being built in Germany has been approved by the German government, the FAIR facility, and we'll also talk about this. And so it's again my great pleasure to welcome uh, Karl Heinz. Thank you, Alex. It's a great pleasure to be here. And let me start with a personal remark. For some 50 odd years ago in Germany, there were two little kids playing with their neighbors, and now today we have very splendid Alex Bittendorfer here, Nina <laughs> Peltz, who was uh, for several years my playmate. Nina, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Nina lives in Melbourne. So now to the science part. Um, I would like to tell you today why Germany is spending something like 2 billion euros to uh, learn more about the fate and the history of the universe. So this is the idea. And on this way, of course, I have a beginning to tell you a little bit how we think. Uh, nuclear physics, which is what we will talk about today, uh, contributes to the history of the universe. This is the idea. Of course, you have the cell facility, and therefore we call out the first big universe in the laboratory. Uh, so you have a little bit of a distance to our big brother, which is CERN of Geneva, which, which is the sun frontier in high energy. And we are, with, we are also an accelerator in contact with nebula and CERN, but we focus on something else, which is the high quantity frontier. So in this way, we are complementary and very important to both. So why? Do we care about what I want to tell you? Why do we care about the universe? <coughs> the first uh, idea which I would like to bring to you is something which Carl Sagan, one of the very famous astrophysicists of the United States, said, and he just simply put it in one sentence that we all start with dust or start with dust. The reason for that is that most of the elements which make us and our surrounding actually were part of stars and exist in there. That's very interesting, but we, we will learn about this later. And uh, you also have to think that this went through several star generations. So as I put out here, there has been here something like uh, hundreds to thousand star generations to get from this to this today. What we see today, I, I have in a slide in a second. So first let me introduce what are nuclei? Why do we care? And uh, what we see is atoms, as we all know, are the building blocks of nature, at least the nature as we know it. And these atoms are made out of uh, two major parts. Uh, these are electrons, and then there's the nucleus in the center. More than 100 years ago, we learned that also a nucleus is made out of stuff. know the number of nucleons in a nucleus, this gives you actually the mass of the nucleus, which is also the mass number. So this is something which you will see from time to time. But there are two different types, you have protons and neutrons. One has a charge, which is a quark. Both have roughly the same mass. 
The number of protons is also very important because the number of protons determines the charge and therefore it determines the chemical nature of stuff. And so when you look into the periodic table, the thing which is de uh, determining is the charge. And you will see this because the atom wants to be neutral and then you need exactly the same amount of electrons as to affect the charge of the uh, in the nucleus, the number of protons. So as I said, the number of protons determines the chemical nature and we all know that depending on this we give different names. For example, if we have only one proton in the nucleus, we talk about hydrogen. If there are six, it's carbon. But the heaviest one, which naturally occurs on Earth, is uranium, and this has much simpler details. Nature has made it a little bit more complicated because for the same number of protons, you can have several numbers of nucleons. And then chemical nature doesn't really change, but the nuclear drastically, and we talk then about the heliotrope if you have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. You know that people like order. So also nuclear physicists then started to think how can we actually show the various nuclei and then they came up with a landscape. So you put on one axis the number of protons and another axis the number of neutrons and then you can plot the nuclei which you know that they can say exist, we already notice that there is a difference because there are about 300 nuclei which are stable. Now it is safe to go into your garden and to pick your plants and find them. But there are many more. About an additional 3,000 have already been produced artificially somewhere in a laboratory. So we know them. But when we say they are artificially produced, they have this problem that they are unstable, which means they do not live forever. Nuclear decay, we all know, seems to be something bad in, in Germany. But on the other hand, if you are a patient, you really like it. Because there are many properties or many applications which are due to a decay that could be quite useful. And I listed a few. This is not a comprehensive list. So, for example, if you lose the H of this half-life, can do determination of ages. So if I would cut or lose, lose the half-life, we can determine ages. For example, for example, I'm not a human. Or some people have done ontology with it, so they have determined the age of the pyramids and have then reordered them to what they call as hierarchies. And probably you have noticed about a, a month ago there was a big story that Greenland sharks are seized apparently these animals This is all being done by using nuclear half-lives to determine this. But you can also use nuclear, half, uh, nuclear decays to localize something. In medicine, we all know if you want to have a special treatment, you can place some radioisotopes somewhere, and the decays will be a little bit thick, and you will be a little tumor. And you can also, in astrophysics, you can look around the sky and maybe you find some decays from some nuclei, and this can pinpoint told you 3,000 are known. Theorists claim that there should be 7,000. But we don't have that. So there's a lot of work still to be done. One of the problems, of course, is that apparently nature is leaving out 7,000 if you go somewhere in the start of your big event. You still need to understand all the nuclear hazards which will be a theme of my talk. So what we would like to know is now how are they distributed. So for this reason, I simply want to go now into our Milky Way. And here is something which is known already since the 40s. This is now simply plotted the number fraction versus the mass number. So it shows how abundant is a certain element or a certain number. And there's a lot of structure on this. I mean, I do not guide you through all details. The thing which you might be interested in is hydrogen is by far the most common element in the 
universe and it's about 71% sunshine. Helium is the second one, 28. And these two together are actually nice in the Big Bang. So in the first three minutes of our universe, the hydrogen and helium fraction is a little bit excited. And then all the protein building we have afterwards, and what we will learn now, and what's happening in stars, a little bit of hydrogen has been changed also into helium and all stars, and has been changed basically also into metals. Now, metals is something that is very interesting because astronomers and astrophysicists call everything in metal, which is which has a proton number larger than two. So if you learn in high school that something like neon is a needle gas or a noble gas, well then astrophysicists is a metal. So you have to remember that. But the interesting thing is also all these fingerprints. You see here is a P in the abundance. This sits where iron uh, is on this curve, or here is uranium, thorium up here, or there's lead. So all these fingerprints have to do with special nuclear properties, which are imprinted in these astrophysical objects where you don't need them anymore. So this is the theme of our story today. So here is again the question, where were these elements being made? I already told you the lightest elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, in the first three minutes minutes. Then the heavier elements up to uranium are made from three million stars. We talk about this. <coughs> and then we also have elements which are heavier than 92, which are artificially being made in the laboratory, of course. You know, researchers are always trying, always curious and trying to find new ways. And up to now, we actually do not know what the frontier is, what are, is the heaviest nucleus which can exist. We do not know. At the moment, the record is proton number 118, has just been accepted as being produced by Salim in Russia. Our own lab was, until a few years ago, the world record holder because the one from 107 to 112 has been made from our lab in Germany. And uh, the important thing is if you make an element, so if you go home and think of a wonderful experiment you do, you make a new element, and if you prove this to the international organization of uh, pure applied chemistry, they then said, okay, you are the winner, you can invent the moon. And then, of course, it's forever in the periodic table. And 110 has been called Dan Shuttle, named after our city, as a thank you from our lab to the city, because it was extremely so popular. It was discovered in, in the year 1994 as the number 110 in the periodic table. This is the gentleman who was the leader of the group to, to find it, to discover it. Then the city built a new convention center, and it's also named Dan Shuttle. And I can tell you that our American friends which come have usually a very hard time to pronounce that word. <laughs> and this year I found on the web, so this was the artist view of Dan Shuttle. I have not the closest idea what you wanted to tell us. So now we go and ask why can the rest be being, being made in stars? And to have the first clue, if I find the cursor, let's look at the movie and put now four protons onto a mask scale and compare to helium four. So what do we see? The four nucleons are heavier than if they are combined to helium four. And the uh, mass difference due to Einstein, we all know, relates to energy difference. And therefore, you really see that fusing nuclei or nucleons, in this case, four of them, the helium four, creates an energy <coughs> It's actually a very strong energy source. And this is what stars are using during their lifetime. Several different stars. So here's our sun, which actually does this kind of hydrogen burning in the center. And I want to show you another movie. So here's the sun, and we will zoom in into the sun. And uh, we start to consider that when a star is born, the temperature in baby is increasing, and particularly in the inferior. So suddenly in the inferior at a certain point, it gets hot enough that nuclei move fast enough to overcome the Coulomb barrier between the protons. 
water, and then something interesting happens. They stick together, form a heavier hydrogen nucleus called deuterium, and submit two particles to keep everything fine balanced, which is a positron and a neutrino. Now, this deuterium is then suddenly available in the sun. It moves around, and you see it needs another proton. And suddenly, we make the next, next nucleus, which is helium-3. Helium-3 moves around. Another helium-3, and you see here the alpha particle and two protons are produced. The two protons are available to be fusion again, and this is the cold chain. This is how the whole sun works for four and a half million years. Don't worry, in our lifetime it will still continue. So if somebody tells you that solar energy should become expensive, it has nothing to do with the fact that the sun is moving its fuel too fast. But we have understood what is happening. We fuse, and of course, having, having done this once, nature can, of course, think to do it in subsequent steps. What happens is now this helium-4 has a larger charge. The problem is that the Coulomb barrier for, for helium with a charge of 2 is larger than the charge 1. So at these conditions in which hydrogen fuses in the sun, helium cannot fuse. Coulomb What happens is the sun and the stars like the sun collect helium or some said as ashes in the center. With its own gravity, it's getting denser and hotter. Now you see what will happen. Once it is hot enough, there's also two helium nuclei can come together. It's a little bit cheaper if it's not two, it's three helium nuclei which have to come together, but it happens. And then <coughs> we start to have helium burning happens in the core, and this hydrogen burning is continuing just outside of the helium ashes, so suddenly the star has two burning regions in the center, it's helium, and then in the sphere around the center, hydrogen burning. And something interesting happens at that phase, when the star is getting into this phase, it's expanding. It's expanding hugely. So a star, and it's at the same time getting a little bit colder on the surface than the sun, and therefore, people talk about something which becomes reddish, if you look at it from the color, and it becomes pink, so it's a red one. This is the antithesis of imagination. And if you look at, this, at a star, which becomes a red giant, and compare it now to the Earth orbit around the sun, this is the size of the star, which is bigger. So when the sun gets into this regime, the Earth always kept around solar mass, but the solar mass in five billion years is less than the solar mass today. That's the fact. Therefore, also the Earth orbit in the Kepler's law is moved out. So the Earth might survive for Venus and Mercury. So don't buy land on Venus and Mercury. <laughs> this might be a problem in five billion years. So now we say that we could also fuse helium. So this is a, a nice slide because it shows you two critical reactions. Three helium-4 nuclei combine to carbon-12. And then carbon-12 combines with another helium-4 nucleus and makes oxygen. This is all. But think of what it would make carbon and oxygen. These are exactly the two building blocks of life as we know it. The life is created at the center of the first cup. Amazing story. Then we continue, and I brought this picture with Alex, it's on you, yeah. Um, so this takes you now through the history of a star, which is a little bit more massive than the sun, 24 hours. We talked about this phase already, hydrogen is burning to helium, helium burns to oxygen, calcium, and then the whole story repeats and repeats and repeats. So all the sea ashes have not the right temperature to fuse, fuse therefore the temperature has to increase, Kelvin, but if it's a fusion temperature, you will think about it. So it's 10 to the 9 Kelvin. And actually, at 10 to the 9 Kelvin, it doesn't matter whether it's a Celsius or Kelvin. Or Kelvin. So it's uh, structurally the same. 
And this continues. One thing which you should look upon is here the time scale. Because I just told you that the sun is already 4.5 billion years old. And here we see hydrogen burning, and the sun is doing hydrogen burning still. In this star, only last 10 million years. So what we learn from this is that the lifetime, the life expectation of a star depends very strongly on the mass of the star. The second thing which we should take home is if you look at these, at these lifetimes, the star basically spends all its life hydrogen burning in the universe, the rest goes all its time. Therefore, if you look at the night sky and try to see a star, you have a 90% probability to find it in helium burning, uh, hydrogen burning and about 10% in helium burning. And this explains one of the fundamental diagrams uh, which Astron physicists, uh, astronomers are using the so-called Hirschsprung-Russell diagram. So now we have to zoom in what happens at this stage. Before we do that, I have to show you another movie. I hope you don't get bored by seeing all these movies, but they are usually better than if I explain them. So this is binding energy now. Uh, we look into a valley of stability, as we would call it. So here up is the neutron and the proton, and now we fall down because everything goes stronger, bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. And all these fusion reactions getting down into this valley is exactly what the star in the universe is waiting for. And this stops the whole principle. And then we come to two nuclei, nickel and iron, and they are the st strongest bound nuclear energy. So once we have reached this regime, then by fusion, by fusion, we do not have an energy source anymore. So the star is running out of its energy. But it produces this ion. And we know that there are heavier ones. We have to talk about this too. So now we have to talk about what happens when we start to create this ion core in the center. So this is a star at this moment where it, has to, where it starts to produce iron in the center. It looks like an onion. People really talk about onion-like structure. And it has memories of what happened during its lifetime. So here's the iron core, we'll talk about it in a second. Around this here is a sphere in which silicon burning is still continuing. And there's a layer of unburned silicon. Then there's oxygen, neon, carbon, helium, But the interesting thing is this center part here. And in the center, you collect up to something one and a half times the mass of our sun. So it's a huge amount of iron which you produce and you put into your center. At the beginning, the radius is roughly the one of Earth. So you can already assume that taking one and a half times the mass of the sun and giving it to the Earth during this is getting solid. But you cannot switch off gravity. So this iron core uh, is, and that is just something which I want to show you here, the iron core has now no source to fight against gravity. Before the star was always imbalanced by the energy it produced due to its direction. Now it doesn't do that anymore in the center. So gravity wins. And this thing collapses collapses in a second or so, very fast. So in about a second, it moves from the Earth radius of 6,000 kilometers to something like 20 kilometers, but from here to the Melbourne Center. The collapse stops. The reason why the collapse stops is in the inner part, you create something which is like a gigantic nucleus. So a nucleus, one and a half times the mass of the sun. And then something comes in, which nuclear physicists would like to understand even better, but we have some hazy understanding. Because this type of stuff, this, this stuff which sits inside the nucleus, inside the lead nucleus, for example, you cannot squeeze as much as you want. It's getting very stiff at a certain point. And so if the collapse happens, it can squeeze 
is in that part a little bit over the proper equilibrium value, so the stuff that fits well into that network, and then it bounces back. And this creates a shock wave, and this triggers the explosion of the star. And what happens is that the binding energy which you obtain by this collapse here is released. And if, opti um, if the center of so is, op is released in optical uh, light, and then you see suddenly a new star coming up. So this is the red, uh, this is the Large Magellanian Cloud before February 22nd, 1987, and this after, so this is a mobile one. So if you compare the energy, the energy is being set free so that this thing can be bright really as a whole galaxy, is something like a hundred suns in your whole lifetime. Actually, 99% of this energy that fits in this plane you don't see is because it comes in a particular place called the Plutonium, which is also a blur if you want. <laughs> so, one last question before I come to the quest how can we actually study this? Of course, these are in all the things that get more interesting for centuries. How can we study this? This gentleman was promising this to a person later became king of Poland and said, I mean, I know, give me the, the resources, in particular pay me, and I make the voyage. So he put it into some castle, he mixed things around, and he found gold. Gold in the form of white porcelain, which became the so-called Meissen porcelain, which is the most expensive porcelain that exists. This was invented and he wanted to make gold and pay for that. Nature knows how to make gold, and the way our nature does it is by very fast nuclear reactions under really extreme conditions, very hot, very dense, many, many neutrons, more than we have in usual sur uh, surroundings. And these nuclei, which are involved, are extremely short-lived. So if we want to mimic how nature makes gold, we have to understand <coughs> Where does nature make it? We do not exactly know. There are two candidates. Today we heard in the talk by my colleague Gabriel, who sits in the back, that there is one probably more likely than the other. The one on the left is the more likely one. So what you see here is a simulation of two neutron stars, which are a binary system, happily circling around each other, but due to contraction at a certain point, they start to touch and they start to merge stars, which are actually the inner, uh, which is actually the part which is created in such a supernova uh, collapse, and these two come together and merge, you can imagine this is extremely exotic in real time, of course. This here is a simulation of a collapsing massive star, so this is a type 2 supernova, at least how here is believed it should happen. The thing which we uh, have to take hold is that the nuclear reaction happening is actually giving the energy. This is really certainly the dynamics of such a gravitation. So this is something which we have to understand to make these simulations. And therefore, nuclear properties matter. The problem is only most of these nuclei are short-lived, very short-lived, and are very difficult to make. And many of them, I'll say even most of them, have never been made so far in the laboratory. To give you another idea of this, here is a simulation on, uh, I didn't want to have this here. No. I should go back. I want to show you such a simulation of, a, of an R process. So this here, I have to explain first and then I let it run. So this is our nuclear chart you've seen neutrons. Up here, this blue curve is what observing meteorites, what observing solar uh, surfaces and, and tell us what the distribution of the elements being made in this process should be, or is from the history of the whole galaxy. So this is what you want to describe. 
up here you see the temperature of the environment, you see the uniform density, number density, don't care about it. Another quantity which is interesting is time, which controls every single thing you want. So this is 0.01 second in the surface calculation. You see temperature as profile here, the number density. And this year the distribution has a color coding. The more reddish it is, the more abundant the nucleus is. And at the same time, this is translated into the current status of Earth in the observation. So probably not understandable, but I run the code anyway. So now we let it run. Where is the cursor here? So if you see it shoots to very, very heavy nucleons, much heavier, heavier than uranium, always do. And all these nuclei are unstable, decay, and have to make have to end up at the end at the stable ones because we only want to live in stable ones. So then you see here the distribution comes up to top ones. And this goes now, of course, it runs for the age of the universe because some of these guys, like uranium and thorium, and this here, have ages as old as the universe. So people have some imagination how this should work. You put in some numbers for the properties of the nuclei. But the question, of course, is, are these numbers right? And of course, the only answer is asking nature itself. So what you want to do is you want to do experiments to learn this. And this is now the rest of the talk. I would like to introduce you now to the new facility where, as Alexander said, the last two stages of the absolutely the last thing you like from the German government is to realize the building. First is this is the current facility existing, so this exists. This is what, what uh, Alexander said, GSI, so the place where I work at the moment. This is already an accelerator complex, as you will see, and this is what we want to construct. Why do we want to construct it? But first let me introduce you to the international endeavor. So this, on this picture you see the various countries being contributing, and there are two colors, there is this brownish color, and these are the owners of the new facility. So this is actually really a company and share, but now open for our national governments. And as an, as an advice, if you want to impress people, try to get Russia in it, because then half of the world is Russia. <laughs> <laughs> but Russia is actually the second biggest shareholder of the facility. So we have one third, but it's very important. Then you see a second color, which is this bluish. And these are the countries where the scientists contribute to the experiment. So they're shareholders, but they also contribute to what we want to do uh, from the facility. It's being done in them. They are colors of countries which are not yet sold out. But yes, Australia is not. So Australia is contributing, building the sector of early knowledge of the aliens in this country. So, the accelerator complex. As I told you, like CERN, we have an accelerator complex. Currently existing is already this accelerator, which is a linear accelerator. It has something special that it was built 40 years ago because it was the first ever which was able to accelerate all elements or protons to the other ones. Then you shoot into a second accelerator, and then it's moving from this one here. It has already reached something like 30 to 50 percent of speed of light. Then we can take what we get out from there, and uh, oh, it's not showing yet, but I have a second graph. It would go then into a story, so I'll tell you in a second. But from the, in the future, we will shoot into an even bigger one, where we come even closer to the speed of light, but also uh, a factor of 100 higher in intensities. And then all these are dis uh, distributed to experiments. These are all experiments here. And there are four big pillars which contribute. There's one which is doing uh, atomic physics, plasma physics. I, I say a word at the end, if there's time. I say also something about this experiment, which is actually studying this very dense matter and seeing how, to comp uh, how much we can compress nuclear matter. This is the one with which we try to produce for the first time many of the nuclei which are important for these astrophysical 
events, for example, for supernova neutron star mergers. And this one here is something also special because we will have unpacked neutrons uh, in the upshot in the future. And with this, uh, we smash the unpacked neutrons and protons and create new states to certainly give the configuration for the So this is sunshine that is. So we build it. This is something which we do in the brain have to go through. For later purposes, let me stress what I said here is a storage ring. So this is a ring in which we can shoot our ions and we can feed them for seconds, minutes, whatever you like, and can look at the same several times to compare things. And then here are certain experiments which we can do in our work. So how can we create artificial nuclei? So we have to simply consider that the only thing which nature gives you are stable nuclei. So now we have to use a trick to create something artificial by hitting some stable on something stable. So you take a target made of carbon, beryllium, and you smash it with a uranium target with enormous energy. And then everything is like a big ring which goes up. That's the trick. Okay. You do this billion times per second, because many of these nuclei are extremely rare. So you have to do it very, very often to have a chance to create that kind of thing. But then comes the next step. If you have this degree of billions of these collisions with everything flying towards you, how do you get the nucleus out to your end state? How do you find the needle in the haystack? And the way to do that is by a huge device, which is called a fragment separator. So what do we do? So this is here a picture again, billions of collisions with the end state. So one of these points here is the nucleus you want to have. So then you send it in into this device, which is 137 meters long. It's existing out of enormous magnets, and the experimentalists know exactly how to push the magnets such that one specific charge and one specific mass is only being let through. All the others are put aside to other magnets. And then this reaches this point here, and then the experimentalists say, oh, I would like to do, I would like to, to learn about how the nucleus looks like in the ground state and now at the solid states. So this is done here by lasers, by other devices. Or, and this is something special in our case, you send it into this ring. But before I show you this, I mean, this is then after the stuff comes through here, and you have put the various mag the magnets right, you can wonderfully orbit the ring. So this is very precise method to pick out what you want. But why do we care so much about these rings? Remember, I mean, it's not very cheap to make these nucleus. So our, we, we expect that our electricity bill will be a few 10 million euros per year to consider this. So then it's better to make the best out of this precious stuff. Other facilities can also make many of these nuclei, and then they can use them once, and then we pay them back. But with ring, we can use them quite often. And this is what I would like to show you now. So now, this is a, a particle getting into the ring, and now it moves around. Actually, there are many particles. And whenever it is moving around, and if, if, if a particle is particle lives something like a millisecond and moves with something like 10 percent or 20 percent of the speed of light, you have a thousand times chance to measure it when it's passing. So we have simply electrodes here. Here's a cooler, here's an electrode. Whenever the particle passes, it gives a signal. And then you get millions of these frequencies of all the particles passing. And then you do something like this wonderful analysis of it. So it passes through the transform get it into some frequencies, and then you get something ordered like this, which already looks much nicer. 
And then you go to the next, and to the next, and then you can resolve it even out there in the case of the private property. Uh, so now it's impressive to say, okay, we are going to cure this people one out of the 700,000. It's a number. But it means, and of course the trick is Einstein, uh, it means that we can measure in the accuracy where the peanut is bigger. This is the accuracy of the number. Okay. So with this thing, we hope that we can improve our understanding of this nuclei and of the universe. What has that come? Here uh, simply some pictures. This is again, you see this nuclear lens with them, the little bit thinner than the other nuclear lens that is all which shows the same thing as we did. So it's protons versus neutrons, and now it, it, it has a little bit of a different color. The black ones are still the stable ones. The dark blue ones, I'm going to say wouldn't let me back to GSI if I had more stress here. These are nuclei which had been made at GSI and these are the first things that we learned of these nuclei. And the light blue ones, this is what we want to go and try to unleash. So the new facility is there and we want to try to unleash the potential. And in here, this is the path which people believe is run in the neutron star merger to make holes. Remember what we talked about some minutes ago? This was before in nowhere land, but when we come to the new facility, we will touch it. Gold is up there. So we will get for the first time data on the nuclei that make it. So now let's go to the center. Let me jump back. I told you that a supernova has a remnant, and this is called the neutron star. And uh, This was a neutron star spinning and simply transformed the thing from a fixed force. Try to imagine, you heard the signal, you drop the frequency of this thing. This is actually the one in the center of Black Nebula. So this is one and a half times the mass of the sun. Strength is something of a radius of 12 kilometers and spinning with this frequency. Some of the open questions is how does such a neutron star actually look in the east? And this is something which we would like to explore as well. And in the inside, one is pretty sure you reach densities which are significantly higher than in the inside of the nuclear star mass called the remnant. So again, the question is how can we produce such matter? And we do that by asking a much larger question. What is actually the phase diagram of this nuclear? Phase diagram we all know from chemistry. This is the one with water. I assume you were already in German, but this is what it's about. But we do not have to discuss the one for water. Here's ice, here's water, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is vapor. Nuclear matter. This stuff should have a very similar phase diagram. So there's also something call a glass of nuclear. So it's something that's totally unstable in nuclear matter, but inside of the nucleus. But nuclear matter has actually something very crazy. If you go over a certain boundary, somewhere here, you come into something where you take the inner part, and we've never talked about so far what a nuclear consists of something, which are called quarks, put together by gluons. So this stuff gets dissolved as you go to either high temperature. This is what actually what the Big Bang did. The Big Bang came from here, this way. It came out of this space and then moved to something else. But it's more interesting also to go to this direction, to see this boundary. And there's a discussion if there's a critical point where vapor, gas, and uh, uh, gas, ice, and, and uh, water consist at the same time. So there's a chance that nuclear matter is the same. We do not know yet because no one took into account. The question, of course, is how can we do that? And what you do is you take a lead nucleus and smash it with a lot of intensity and a lot of energy onto another lead, say, on uranium, say, uranium. So you take the heavy 
this stuff properly and really put it together. If they come and smash it with each other, we can, of course, they compress the stuff. And they can become hot. So what you create is something, and since it's relativistic, You would like to know what is going on in this hot fireball, so now you have to ask what are the messengers of the properties out of this hot fireball. That's the endocrinous because you do it again to control. The impossible to observe the <coughs> So you take the second test, then. and these are so-called lab tests, electrons and muons. The reason for that is they do not participate in the strong interaction with So you build then a huge detector like this. It took me human beings some more years to get an idea. Uh, so this is huge. So this will be built. And this collects then everything which comes out of this collection. And then you put everything backwards. Of course, you can imagine you have big computers. Our computer center is 20 by 20 by 20 meters. That's a huge amount of space. And then you do it backwards. So this is another experiment we are looking forward to. So then let me say a few words at the end to atomic physics, because atomic physics at our lab is also different than atomic physics in our physics. <coughs> because our people use again these storage and physics detectors. <coughs> so what you do is you take a uranium nucleus and in a controlled way you take is like helium or like helium, but has a charge of 92. So nature is not in it. So then you take this nucleus, that is iron, and let it pass very close to another nucleus. Then there are enormous electric and magnetic forces. They are strong then when on the surface of neutron stars. You have to, to look, of course, very fast. So this is a way to understand the fundamental interaction which keeps this happening, I mean, which keeps chemistry working. Now in the very, very exciting time. But you can do something else, and I put here a test of fundamental symmetries. Einstein, we all know, <coughs> had this wonderful idea of special relativity. Of course, you know, I mean, you become only famous, really famous, if you prove that Einstein know that there are many people who have to try very hard. And so far, everyone failed. But one is tough. But on a serious note, of course, you have to test is he really right. So how good is special relativity test? And how can you do that? So what you do is you take a nucleus like lithium, we already know. And the atomic physics of lithium is well known. So you, there are two transitions where you can excite one electron from this to this state, and you can you also know the difference between these two states in lithium. You know them on many digits, very precise units. So now you take this lithium nucleus and put it into the brain and let it move with 30% or it's 34% of the speed of light. And then you have a laser which is looking towards the lithium and one which is so it's worded in two different terms, the physical state. And if Einstein is right, then the frequencies which you see in the system moving towards you and moving away from you, multiplied with each other, divided by these, by the product of these two should be exactly right. So this is prediction special relativity. We have done the test, and Einstein is going to Thank you.
this in this case. But I just tell you that our experimentalists, of course, are waiting for the new facility because then they can go for the ninth digit. So one word at the end. We also do biofuels, so if you have accelerators, <coughs> you can do something which can destroy DNA in cells. This is actually what it would take to do that. And yes, it depends on whether you have the acceleration in the control or not. So if you are an astronaut and you are moving into something which comes from an uncontrolled accelerator, such as the Higgs, you are hit and some of your DNA <coughs> is destroyed and this may also be severe. But if you go into an accelerator which is very well under control, and you can aim at cells which do not want to have those in the cancer cells, you can destroy them and you can create cancer. So this has been done and this is Hadron Therapy Center in Heidelberg, nearby, which was built after CSI did the pioneering experiments. Uh, and uh, the end came in a bit at the end. Why is one doing this? Of course, there's curiosity. You want to learn how nature works. This was a driving force for the Atom Atomic Carbon Cancer Project. <coughs> the other Western world, and they depict Thomas Piketty, who also depicts this, and of course a lot of other Western world. Um, he was pointing out that we have the skills and technology, which is part of the Western world, of the Western culture that we built. It's good for our future society, and of course, we are creating a lot of young people for the next generation. And we do none of that of course is why are these PhDs so adorable. The reason is simple. Of course we hope to do it some years after this. That's why I put it on my side. Second is of course these guys solve complex problems. So we learn how to solve problems. They use forefront technology and IP systems to solve these problems. They are mobile. They are mobile. And I showed you a map of what can be or something can work. They have social skills. They get forced to work in groups, not only as a few experimentalists. And it's an international environment. They learn languages. So this is the basis of their success. And therefore, we are very happy that we have 250, uh, 2,500 scientists, many of them young people. And we will do this is one of our graduate schools. And they have a nice sub -idea project. And they're looking forward to do something. It is last for for the guys who created the Thank you. Question. Every one of you can of course propose a term. We are an open lab. Whoever has a great idea can come and propose the experiment with an international committee first to do the good experiment. Thank you. So, so please propose your experiment. A question, not an experiment. Um, many of the uh, theories and concepts developed in pursuit of what you are doing produce results which can be used later by technologists. But do you have a definite focus on some development, on, on new technologies or anything like that, or is it all purely theoretical? Small German island called Helgoland to cure this pain killer, and 
there you have the two ideas, the uncertainty principle and the unsolving fact. You will certainly not think of it. But mobile phones, computers, and everything around you which is now based on quantum computing. This is something which you have to say to you. It's number one. Number two is, of course, there are applications for the There are always people. And, and in an environment where you have different ideas coming together, there are always people who say, oh, what he found there, I can use there. Our best example is actually the cancer thing, which turned out, I mean, now maybe I can say two or three words more on this. So this was done by biophysicists who really believe things, that these are not allowed to treat patients, so they did this triangular work, which proves that it could work, and then you have to convince physicians to come in. At the beginning, of course, the patients would get treated for the life expectation of their primary disease. Because who wants to get into a room uh, if you are, if you have to be there for every day? We did it, started in 97. The survival rate, which is measured in five years after the treatment, this, of course, in places where the surgeons cannot go. So the safest place is the brain. Where we are here. And of course, you have to have a shelter, something which is extremely precise. Because you do not want to destroy something else which is in the brain. So our measure of uh, treatment of cancer by the empirics was unique. So in this way you can say India. And then It is too expensive, nobody would do it. So society always balances gain versus use. But it turned out that the treatment of our therapy, of our therapy, is cheaper than the chemotherapy. So at that moment, all health insurance companies in Germany were on our side. <laughs> and now there are two facilities in Germany. There's one in Davis, Italy, which uh, so it's spreading. The US is thinking of it in Texas, so this is spreading. It's not for all cancer treatments. Many think you would go and, and maybe the surgeon can do it better. But there's certain things, the spine or the brain, you must think. Uh, now we are working actually on something called moving target because to have a purity of a millimeter, your body should not move during the time. So now you have time to have, you have to have a loop which actually tells the beam which office is moved during or makes the beam with the patient. So that loop is the precognitive for that. And actually this is a way already because there's another group which has independently developed this in Japan. They seem to be trained on this. Proof of principle has been done two years ago. Uh, there are so so called cardiac uh, arrhythmias. So, this is of course something which surgeons would like to go in at the computer and, and then draw your bleed in the heart so that the conjunction is, is uh, uh, taken away. So, you can do it with the EEG, of course. So, that the first experiments were done in the field. Four people. One is treated by heart attack. Thirty were then available for doing experiments for working out with geometry. So you have to take a single center. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, when will the new facility be operational? I suppose it'll be in stages, but we, we are aiming to have first three in 2022. So six years from now. That's the whole thing. No, the whole thing is is done in 2025. Right. Because we build it in a staged approach. So there are experiments which can go already and we build still.
Do you have any more questions? If not, let's thank Karl Heinz one more time. <laughs>